Good afternoon. How are you this afternoon? Five o'clock. It's almost happy hour. It's always happy hour at South by Southwest. Oh, you can have a beer in the morning. <laughs> All right. Um, so my name is Genevieve, and I want to welcome you to the South by Southwest Intelligent Future Track. This track brings together experts, or in this case, expert, uh, to discuss AI and a wide variety of other new and amazing technologies. The technologies we're talking about today have opened up a world of incredible possibility and lots and lots of questions. But before I introduce the session, let me tell you a little bit, a little housekeeping stuff. Um, this year, we've scheduled lots of Encore presentations. Encore sessions are a redo of a previously popular session, and you can find them by searching Encore in the online schedule. Today is the first day of the trade show. What, what? Get your free stuff. Um, there are tons of booths from all over the world. Starts at 10 a.m., closes at 6 p.m. It's the final day of the South by Southwest job market and final day of Wellness Expo at the Palmer Event Center. You don't need a badge and all events there are free. Today is the first day of free panels and presentations organized by General Assembly also at the Palmer Event Center. Across the street, the Mercedes-Benz and smart companies have built out Palm Park with food and drinks, a tiny house from Casita, curated talks, musical acts, art installations, and a whole bunch of new tech. And now the session you've all been waiting for, the intelligent, proactive future of, mm -mm, that's not what it is. I'm gonna read you actually about the speaker because all week I've been introducing people and you know, <laughs> every once in a while you come across one of these amazing people and you're like, he did what? You all, oh, so you didn't just write a book, you also did that too? So this is Jamie Metzl. Let me tell you a little bit about Jamie Metzl. Jamie is a tech futurist, science fiction novelist, a geopolitical expert at the Atlantic Council, and he's an Atlantic Council senior fellow. He served on the U.S. National Security Council, State Department, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and with the United Nations in Cambodia. None of us have done that much stuff, none of us. He's the author of four books and has a new book, Homo Sapiens 2.0, Genetic Enhancement and the Future of Humanity will come out early next year. Jamie holds a PhD from Oxford and a Harvard Law degree, and he's an Ironman triathlete and ultra marathoner. I am so tired just talking about this guy. So give him a huge round of applause, Jamie Metzl. That was awesome, all right. <laughs> now I really need to show up after that introduction. So what I'm gonna do is, I know it's the end of the day, I'd like for everybody to stand up. Everybody up, because we were all tired, it's been a very long day, and I'm sure everybody was out late last night. So I want you to, to, to close your eyes, take a deep breath in, all the way, and just hold it. And think of just your most relaxing thought, like floating on a cloud or something. And now release out. And now open your eyes and take your arms and slowly lift them above your head. And down. Great. And now take your hand and take your phone. <laughs> and with your phone, lift, put your phone in your right hand and lift your phone and your two hands up in the air and keep them up. All right. And if, while I'm speaking, you're thinking, wouldn't it be great to share all of this knowledge with my friends through Twitter or some other mechanism, take your phone in your right hand and put it in your left hand. But otherwise, keep it in your right hand. If, over the next hour, your pet is undergoing some kind of emergency surgery, and you need to be in the loop, and your phone is still in your right hand, take your phone in your right hand and put it in your left hand. If your phone is still in your right hand, put it in your pocket, and let's be present here, and in 45 minutes we can all take it out. So, good, all right, now you can, now you can, uh, you can sit down. So thank you for that, for that exercise. I hope you don't feel like you've been duped. Uh, but, I'm here, um, like we're all here because we recognize what a critically important moment this is, not just for us as individuals, but for our species. 
And we've been talking today and yesterday about these miraculous technology revolutions and these interconnected technology revolutions that are changing so much in our lives. But the real, the biggest revolution, as I see it, of this coming century, this century, is not the, just the tech revolution, it's the biotech revolution. And within the biotech revolution, it's the genetic and genomics, and as Daniel Kraft said, the omics, all of the interconnected biological systems that are going to, sh that are going to change in fundamental ways. And the way I like to talk about this is that after 3.8 billion years of evolution by the principles that we all learned a long time ago, the Darwinian principles of random mutation and natural selection, we are turning a corner in our evolutionary trajectory as a species, moving toward a future where we will increasingly direct our own evolutionary process with just massive implications, some of which we're going to, we're going to talk about uh, today. So in the 1950s, as you know, Watson and Crick identified the double helix structure of DNA. And in many ways, what they were doing was identifying a manual of life. And with all of the advances in sequencing the genome, what that was about was reading the code of life. And now with precision gene editing like CRISPR, what we are beginning to do is write and hack the code of life. So when we think about technologies that are readable, that are writable, that are hackable, what we think about are these technologies that are now in, in all of our pockets, uh, which is our information technology. But the fundamental change of the biotechnology revolution is that we are going to recognize our own genetic code for what it is, yet another form of information technology. And right now, because of the way that we traditionally have seen biology, we think of biology as fixed. And that's why when somebody dies prematurely of some kind of uh, genetic disease, we often have a tendency to think, well, it's terrible, but that's what biology does. Biology has a lot of bugs. Or when we see science fiction films of the distant future, and we see all of this incredible technology and the spaceships and all of those things, but the people look just like us. And I guess it's because that's the only actors you can find these days, but, but our biology is not going to be constant as we enter this new phase of our evolutionary trajectory. And if we had a time machine and traveled a thousand years into the past and took a baby and brought that baby back to today and placed that baby with a family, that child would grow up to be just like the rest of us. But go a thousand years into the future, get that child, bring that child back to today, and that child would be a genetic superman or superwoman. They would live longer, healthier, more robust lives than, all, than most of us. They would have new capabilities that now we associate with outlier humans, or perhaps with animal species, or new traits that, we, that haven't yet shown up in humans or animals, but that we can construct over time using the building blocks of life, because that is how we are increasingly going to see all of biology. And we have a long way to go from here to there, but this process over time, increasing in velocity exponentially, as, as Daniel Kraft said on this stage just a little while ago, is going to start moving faster and faster and faster. And so when we look back, when we look in the rear view mirror about what a 10 year, a 10 year unit of change is, we think in our minds, oh, that's 2008 to 2018. But that amount of change will happen much more quickly. Maybe over the next five years, we'll get that same 10-year unit of change. And then maybe over the following two years, that same amount of change. And then one year, and pretty soon, the trajectory of change as more and more of life becomes digitized is going to increase. And that's going to change lots and lots of things. But one of the things that it's going to change is how we think about our lifespan, how long we live, and our health span, perhaps more importantly, how long we live healthy and more robust lives. And so 
this is nothing new. Humans, for as long as we have records, have been dreaming about escaping this mortality. That's in some ways why, depending on your theology, why we invented the gods, these gods that are immortal, that, can, that have this, these qualities of living, of overcoming death that humans don't have. The, the oldest um, work of literature that we have is the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Sumerian Epic of Gilgamesh from over 4,000 years ago. And it's all about Gilgamesh, who's the king of Uruk, and his best friend, Enkidu, dies, and he is inconsolable. And so he realizes that he is going to die as well. And he sets out on this epic journey to find the secret of life. And he finds there was a one man who had been granted immortality by the gods, a, a Sumerian version of Noah, who had, had survived a, a flood. And he goes to this guy, Utnapishtim, and apologies to any Akkadian speakers here if I've mispronounced that. Um, and Utnapishtim first says, well, I'll tell you the secret if you can stay awake for seven days, which Gilgamesh can't do. But then his wife says, oh, you should just, just tell him. And so he says, all right, there's this special plant, and you have to get it at the bottom of the sea. And he, they take him to there, he goes to this place, and he goes down to the bottom of the sea, and he gets this plant. Uh, and then, and we'll talk about this later, why we shouldn't be doing too active self-experimentation, rather than it probably would have been a good idea for Gilgamesh just to swallow the plant right there. But he has this idea, well, why don't I take this plant back to Uruk and get some old guy in Uruk to take this plant and then see if it works with that guy, and if it works for him, then I'll, then I'll take it. So he takes it back, and then he's bathing, and a snake comes and steals the plant, and as the snake slithers away, the snake eats the plant and the snake is rejuvenated, but Gilgamesh can't find, doesn't know how to find another version of this, of this plant, so the secret is, uh, is lost. Methuselah in the Bible lives to 969 years. Otherwise, he's kind of a minor character. No one really knows what his exercise re uh, regimen was, um, what he ate, but he lived 969. But then, just a few verses later in the Bible, um, Jehovah says, um, but I've decided that the longest anybody can live is 100, 120. So that is also lost. The Chinese uh, traditionally have a magic mushroom that people can eat that gives, that provides immortality. The Indian Hindu culture, there's amrita, also known as soma, which is another plant that can be digested uh, to give uh, immortality. So we've been searching for it. Um, but it's been very, very hard to find. But that doesn't mean that we haven't made progress. At the time, our, our hunter-gatherer ancestors uh, probably lived to about an average age of 18. And the reason that they did wasn't that they didn't have the biological capacity to live longer. It's just that when you're living in that kind of environment, any small thing that goes wrong, whether it's through a predator or an injury or a small infection, any little thing that goes wrong um, is very likely to kill you. That's, that's actually why in nature you don't see lions attacking every, uh, every zebra that they can, because if you just, if you, if you sprain your ankle, if you have any little injury, it's kind of uh, game over. So that's a, it's a very vulnerable place to be. But as we move through the agricultural age, there was slow increase both in total longevity and in average lo uh, longevity. And the average long uh, numbers are weighed down um, because uh, of the way that averaging works. So if, if you have high infant mortality, average lifespan uh, is low. But at the time of the Roman Empire, average lifespan was only 25. And in 1900, average lifespan in the United States was still only 47. But then, in the late 19th century, uh, we began to have the scientific revolution that has changed our lives in so many fundamental ways, many of which that we're, we're talking about here at, uh, at South By. So in 1889, there was a major seeming advance in longevity when a Russian-French doctor who had just come back from Egypt and had seen these Egyptian court eunuchs, and they all seemed to be a bit sluggish. And so he had this idea, the reason that they're sluggish is that their testicles have been removed. Therefore, all you have to do is 
find some monkeys, cut off their testicles, um, open up a human uh, testicles, or a human scrotum, insert the testicles, and sew it up. So there was a, around, certainly around the United States and in Europe, this was extremely popular. It was so popular um, that a monkey reserve, special monkey reserve, needed to be set up in Africa for all of these monkeys. As a matter of fact, they started a choir. They didn't, I'm just kidding. Um, and then it turned out that that didn't work. So that, that, unfortunately, that didn't work. If anyone wants to try it, though, um, we're doing, uh, Daniel Kraft is doing a double-blind study to see if that should be brought back. So Daniel is, is in the back. You can talk with him. Um, and then early, early 20th century, well, that didn't work. But another doctor, again, very popular doctor, uh, in around 1910 had an idea. Well, the problem was the sewing. But if you ground up goat testicles and just injected them, that ought to work. And that didn't work. And then there were various elixirs of long life and all these kinds of things that people were drinking in the early 20th century, and none of that worked. But what did work, what brought the most miraculous extension of human lifespan and health span over the course of the 20th century were these basic and fundamental advances in medical care in sanitation, in nutrition, in lifestyle. And over the course of the 20th century, average American uh, developed world lifespan expanded by three months per year. And so from that base of 47 in 1900, today average lifespan uh, in the United States is just, uh, just shy of 80. Uh, in in uh, Japan, where it's highest, it's, it's 83. Uh, world average is 70. So we've made these incredible and very significant advances. But the question is, starting from the baseline of where we are now, what is possible going forward? And it's a big and complicated question, but that's what I want to talk about, uh, about today. First, conceptually, and then actually. So conceptually, to think about, well, what is possible? It will not be possible just by eating healthier food or exercising uh, a little bit more for all of us to live longer than the oldest recorded human, the oldest credibly recorded human. And I'll talk about her uh, in a moment. So we are, there are lots of things that we all uh, can do. Uh, we can, to enhance, increase average lifespan across the population, certainly motor safety and addressing the opioid crisis and all those kinds of things will, um, will have an impact. But we think that for each of us, what are the things that we can do to live longer and live healthier? There are a few questions that we need to answer. The first and most fundamentally is what is aging? And it's a really important question because there are some people who think that aging is a bunch of different independent systems in the body. And there's a maddening number of parts and systems in the body, and they're all aging at different rates. And so if aging is just a bunch of different parts aging at different, uh, at, uh, at different rates, and there's not a unified aging process, then it will be like whack-a-mole. Because even if you fix 90% of the problems, there'll be 10% of the problems. It's like if you have your car. If you fix everything but the carburetor, it's great, but your car is not, uh, is not going to work. So one is, is aging a unified process, or is it a bunch of, of individual processes, processes that aren't fully connected? So that's, that's a big, big question that needs to be answered. And scientists are not in full agreement about what aging is. Some say uh, it's the, the slow uh, decrease in capabilities of the body. Some say it's an increase of inflammation. Some, it's a reduction of stem cells. There's a very active debate in the scientific community about what aging actually is. And connected to that, uh, about how to measure aging. So in aging, we have chronological age, which is very easy uh, to measure, although most people uh, seem to lie about, it on, about that online, but that's a separate topic for another day. Um, and there's biological age. It's like, how healthy are you? So we all know people who are um, chronologically older, but seem to be younger and healthier and, and more vigorous than their age would recommend, would suggest. And there are people um, who are 
who seem older than what they ought to be. And that's because we all have a, bi a, a biological age that is different. Uh, and the rate of aging for all of us is, um, uh, is different. And so there's a big movement now to try to identify these so-called biomarkers of aging. And the gold standard is to find measures, biological markers of aging that are uniform so that we have a way of saying, well, this person is chronologically this age, but analyzing the entirety of the systems within their body, we think they are biologically this other age, or maybe it's the same age. And to have a system that works across um, human and animal models and is replicable. And that's very, very hard to do, but certainly there's a lot of progress that's being made into, in understanding the mechanisms of aging how aging works, and whether aging can be seen, as I believe it can, as an overarching system of systems that can be, um, that can be manipulated. Another way of trying to understand what changes are possible is to look elsewhere. And so one is to look in our own evolutionary past to try to get some clues and some ideas about what or what might not be possible. The good news is that evolution doesn't seem to really care about how old we live. And the reason is because so many of us died young in all of our history. And so there was never really a huge role. I mean, it's great to have people in their 80s or 90s around, but we evolved as a species with very few of them, uh, of them around. And so evolution didn't select for us to die at 80 or 90 in the way it selected for us to use oxygen. It didn't select um, for aging the way it selected for us to use sexual reproduction to drive our, our diversity, which is our core of how we evolve as a, as a species. And that's very, very good news, because if we had had a problem of our, uh, too many of our children being eaten by predators, we would have developed a mechanism like, uh, like the uh, Lombard's chameleon in Madagascar, where the entire, once the, the, the females lay eggs, the entire adult population dies every, every generation. And so the new chicks are hatched on their own. All they have is their genetic signals for how to be. And for us, if we had a problem with too many parents getting eaten by predators, we probably would have evolved to have our children like that, to be born with fully formed brains, to not require the kind of tutelage and parenting that our children uh, require. But we didn't because parents are so essential to our development and our advantage as human beings. But we didn't have that kind of selection for grandparents. Grandparents have been a great bonus, and they're wonderful to have around, and we're all obviously better off for having them, but evolution hasn't made a big decision about grandparents. That's good news number one. Good news number two is that we are all the descendants of people who were the very few humans and pre-humans uh, to survive near starvation events. Uh, multiple times over the last almost four billion years and twice over the last 150,000 years, the human race has gone down to about one or 2,000 people. And most recently, once 150,000 years ago, and once at the time of the great uh, Sumatran um, uh, um, volcanoes 75,000 years ago. And at that time, there were only about 1,000 or so humans left on the very southern tip of South Africa. And what that means is that our ancestors were the ones who survived repeatedly these experiences of tremendous scarcity when everybody else died. And the good news is that means that we are the descendants of those super resilient people. And we have within all of us the genetic capabilities that they had that let them survive that hardship. And we're going to talk about that in a moment, but that's a capability that we have the potential of tapping. Another place that we can look is at the longest lived humans. And so the longest lived uh, person, the person who's lived the longest in recorded history um, that we know of and is credible is a French woman named Jean Calment, who was born in 1875 in Arles 
uh, she actually met Van Gogh when she was a young girl, uh, and she died in 1997 at the age of 122. When she was 90, um, she sold her apartment to this young lawyer who agreed to pay her a certain amount um, per month for as long as she lived. And when that person, that person died before her, and his family was contractually bound to keep paying her. And she was very colorful. She ate two pounds of chocolate a day. Uh, she rode her bike uh, around, uh, around town until uh, she was almost 115. And she famously said, I've only had one wrinkle in my life, and I'm sitting on it. Um, <laughs> but so having a positive attitude is, is very important. So Jean Calment, she died in 1997 at the age of 122. So we can think of that it's just with the biology that we have or could conceivably have now as humans. Maybe 122 is the upper limit. So that's individually. We can also look at groups. So people like Nir Barzilai at Albert Einstein and others are finding these super agers, these healthy people living over 100 years, uh, years of age, and they're sequencing and understanding their life, sequencing them, understanding their life histories to try to understand what are these people doing. And the answer is genetics. I mean, if you want to live to 90, you should do all the things and have a great lifestyle. If you want to live past 100, you have to choose your parents wisely because you're not going to make it without the right, uh, the right genetics. So one thing uh, that is happening is trying to understand these groups of, of superagers. And it's kind of incredible because we think about living long. We think, well, yes, in some ways I'd like to live long, but I don't want to be in terrible shape for a longer time. But these people who live past 100, they're aging. It's not this slow decline. It's pretty steady and then a precipitous drop. And the average person who dies past 100 has only 30% of the health care costs in the last year of their life as the average person dying in their 70s. So, it's, so the people who live longer, super longer, are actually living healthier. And then a third place that we can live, look is not at the individual uh, people who are living long, but groups that are, are living a long time. My friend Dan Butner uh, studies this, and he, he has identified the five places in the world which he calls blue zones, which are places where whole communities live longer. Uh, and I'll talk in a moment about the reasons why he believes uh, they live longer. So that's, that's one place that we can look. Another place that we can look is in at the comparative biology of different related animals that have very, very different uh, life and health spans. So one of the pairs of animals that we can look at is between the mouse, uh, which can live about three years in, in captivity, and the naked mole rat in the Horn of Africa that can live up to 31 years um, in, in, um, in this really incredible uh, structure. They live underground. Um, they have very few predators because they live underground in a way that, that, that few other uh, animals can reach. Um, and so lots of people are studying the naked mole rats and trying to understand why it is that they can, uh, that they can, uh, can live so long. And one of the reasons is that because they don't have predators, they haven't had to expend evolutionary energy developing defense mechanisms, like do horns or fangs or all of those kinds of the ability to fight. They don't have any of those things because they live underground. They're extremely social. They have highly structured social environments. And so they haven't had to divert that energy. And what they can do is then use that energy to be reproductive for much, a, a much greater percentage of their lives than most, uh, than most other animals. That's why naked mole rats are cancer free. And they have all of these kind of incredible capabilities. And so comparing how a mouse functions and how a related naked mole rat functions, that's another way of gaining insight into what are the differences in, in, uh, in aging. Another pair of related animals uh, is the hard clam, which is when you go to a restaurant and you order clams, chances are you're going to have a hard clam. They can live about 40 or up to 50 years. And the way you know how old they are is that in the clam shell, it's kind of like a tree. You can count the rings connected to aging. But the, the quahog clam, which is a cold water clam, they can live around 500, up to around 500 years. As a matter of fact, the oldest quahog clam that was ever found was in the, in out, near Iceland. The water's just outside of Iceland. And they, the researchers brought it up, and then they opened up this clam, and they started counting those rings. It was like one, two, 
Wow, 500, 501. They got to 506. And then, unfortunately, the clam died because they had opened up the clam as part of the, of the counting process. So the clamicide happened at 506. We don't know what, what else could have been possible. And one of the reasons why these clams can live so long um, is that they have an internal mechanism for preventing oxidative stress, and they have very low metabolism, kind of like the long-lived turtles in Galapagos uh, and elsewhere. So they're very low. Um, metabolism helps them maintain their, their energy uh, over time. And a third, and kind of my favorite one of these, uh, of these animals to look at, um, is the, the so-called immortal jellyfish. And jellyfish are, are just incredible in so many ways, but these immortal jellyfish can go from adult stage back into polyp stage, and then from polyp stage back into adult stage. So they're going back and forth between young and old. It's kind of like humans being adults and then becoming embryos and then becoming adults and then becoming embryos. In my science fiction uh, novel, Eternal Sonata, which is about extreme human life extension, that's the, 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 the scientist who's trying to find a cure for cancer um, uses uh, uh, parts of the jellyfish DNA to try to revert the cancer genes. And it doesn't really work because the system is so complex, but then he tries another approach and figures out a way of using this same uh, DNA to revert the genetic age of entire organisms. And that is what is the, this breakthrough that allows him to discover the scientific um, elixir of, of life. And of course, because it's a sci-fi thriller, he compartmentalizes um, and encrypts the data, and then he's murdered, and then there's a whole international effort to try to gain control of that, of that information. But there is real, there are real examples from our not that distant relatives. I mean, we were, we and, and, um, and uh, jellyfish were the same thing only a short 600 million years ago, and we have many of the same genes. Um, so it's not crazy to think that different stuff can be made of the genetic materials that we and other organisms have. And we can also look at individual organisms, and probably the organism that's been manipulated the most is the C. elegans roundworm, which is a tiny little roundworm the size of a, of a comma. And what they've done with roundworms and fruit flies um, and flies and, and even mice, um, but what they've done is developed strains that are very long-lived. And it's relatively easy to do, because you get a bunch of, of roundworms and put them in a dish. Um, when the food starts to run out, they'll be the last few that survive. And then you breed those. And then you do it again and again and again. And eventually, you can get roundworms um, that live much longer than the original roundworms. And then you can genetically compare, you can sequence and compare the genes of these very long-lived roundworms and the genes of the short-lived roundworms. And you can say, well, what's the difference? And that's what Cynthia Kenyon and others have, uh, have done. And what they found is there's a very small number of genes that they called DAF2 or DAF16 that when either turned on or turned off can double, triple, quadruple uh, the lifespan of these, of these roundworms. And it's not just that they're living longer as decrepit roundworms, but they're living healthier longer. So again, these are a lot of these, these genes have human equivalents. And so it's not that we are going to do the exact same thing to us, um, even though we have, as I talked about in our evolutionary pa past, kind of done the same thing. Um, but it points us in a direction of what kind of manipulations might be possible uh, to start to turn the knobs of the aging process. And that's what really all of this, um, all of this is about. And it's this recognition, increasingly, that aging is connected, that there are these different ways to hack biology, many of which can have an impact on how long we live and how healthy uh, we, how we are as we live that long. And now scientists are doing a lot of different work in many of these different areas to try to figure out how do we turn those knobs? What are the trade-offs in turning knobs? Because we have 3.8 billion years of evolution with lots of different trade-offs. And so there are things that, well, you could change. If you change one thing, it's never in a vacuum. 
there are always trade-offs. Um, but one of the, of the insights of Cynthia Kenyon's and other people's uh, work is that there is this constant trade-off within ourselves, within our cells, between how energy is allocated, and it's either for growth or for repair. When we are young, we need that energy to go towards growth because there are so many growth demands of our body to grow, to make our brains function, and to thrive. But as we get older, we don't want too much growth. Actually, we want to shift into repair mode, in the equivalent of screensaver mode. And what a lot of these interventions are doing is helping us go in, into a mode, a cellular mode, of screensaver, of really focusing on preserving our, our energy so that we can last over a, a, a longer time. So all of this is the preamble, and now I'm going to tell you how, if we can, uh, we can all live longer and healthier lives. And I mean, I'll do it kind of step by step, near term, medium term, and long term. So in the near term, the most important things that we can all do are the things that you already know. I talked about Dan Buettner and the Blue Zones. What did the people do in all these places uh, where they live long? They all exercised every day, and they, they weren't necessarily jogging or doing Ironmans, but they were living in places, whether they were sheep herding or just places where they had to, uh, had, they had to constantly move. That's critically important. They all had relatively low calorie, mostly plant-based diets. They probably didn't eat, they didn't eat processed foods or crap. Um, uh, they all had strong social networks uh, that, whether it was families or communities, and they all had what the, uh, what the Japanese call ikigai, or the French raison d'etre, kind of a reason for being, a mission in life, a sense of, of purpose. And so we all know that those things are critically, uh, critically important. And, and one of the things that I think is just really uh, important, um, and they're all important, but is exercise. Uh, for any person who's coming here, the reason why you're here is that you'd like to learn about how you and we can live longer and healthier lives. But if we had a pill that did what exercise can do, people would be attacking their pharmacies in order to get it. Because they've done massive meta-studies of exercise. And what they found is that if you do only an hour and 15 minutes of exercise a week, you, your life expectancy increases by 2.5 active years relative to everybody else. And if you do two and a half hours a week, which is really not that much, then um, you get three, uh, three hours more than everybody else. And if you do an hour a day, you get 4.5 additional healthy years for your life. And so if you want to live longer and live healthier, exercise is really important. But then what are the hacks? I mean, we're all here, we're at South By, because we believe, well, there's the regular biology, and how can we hack? How can we hack every system? And there are hacks. So one of the hacks, as, we've, as we know, is calorie restriction, which works in lots of animals, and it technically ought to work with us, although the, in human models it's been mixed. And one of the reasons why it's hard to test is it's really hard to force humans to do calorie restriction for decades at a time. We are just cheaters, we, unfortunately. Um, but the good news is um, recent studies have, so, have shown that you don't need to have a calorie-restricted diet of about 1,200 calories a day to get the benefits of calorie restriction. What you can do is have five continu continuous days of calorie restriction in two months in an entire year, and you can get the same kind of, of benefit. So certainly calorie restriction, even with that limited, in that limited way, is certainly uh, beneficial. But, not everybody even wants to, uh, wants to do that. And then we have a lot of different drugs that mimic our bodies, not just calorie restriction, but what's happening in calorie restriction is that our bodies are remembering our evolutionary past when our ancestors almost starved, and we were the ones who had that capac uh, capacity to survive in moments of stress. And so what the question is, are there drugs that can make our body feel that it's having that experience and trigger the positive parts of that without the negative parts. And it turns out that there are. In the Middle Ages, um, there was a drug, which at that time was called goat's rue, or French lilac, 
that they gave to people um, who had the problem that they were peeing all the time. And now we know that if, people, if somebody is peeing all the time, it's probably a sign or could be a sign that they have diabetes. And since the 1950s and approved in the 1990s, the most popular type 2 diabetes drug in the world is French lilac or goat, or goat syrup, but now it has a scientific name called metformin. And what they've found in studies is when they started to do studies on people who were taking metformin for diabetes, they had three groups, people with diabetes taking metformin, people with diabetes taking some other diabetes drug, and then uh, people without diabetes. And so they had these three, and it turned out that not only were the diabetics with metformin outliving the people, the diabetics, who were taking some other diabetes drug, they were also outliving the people who didn't have diabetes and who weren't taking any drug. And the reason is because the signaling mechanism inside of our cells is the uptake of glucose, insulin. And it, it kind of makes sense that in our cells, when people have diabetes, it's like there's the sugar. It's like their, their cells are getting the wrong message. It's go, 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 and that's why you have all those fluctuations. So it kind of makes intuitive sense that a drug that slows down that process would shift on a cellular level from growth mode to repair mode. So uh, metformin is this incredible drug. Uh, human trials for non-diabetics called TAME um, is, are, just, are just beginning, but I'm quite confident that in the not distant future, older people without diabetes will be taking some version of metformin. A second drug that again is doing a similar thing is called rapamycin. In the 1960s, uh, Wyeth Pharmaceuticals sent scientists uh, to Easter Island to collect soil samples. And in the sample, uh, they found one uh, bacteria, did, did a great job of suppressing other bacteria and fungal growth. And when they isolated this, drug, this um, bacteria, it turned out that it had these incredible properties that could be used as an immunosuppressant because it's like you're doing your thing and you're trying to keep the immune system from acting up. And this drug is called rapamycin after the traditional name of Easter Island, Rapa Nui. And it's a very similar thing. As a matter of fact, last year at South by Southwest, Matt Camberline spoke, who's the world's expert on rapamycin. And when in, when in all of the animal studies for rapamycin, they all live about 25 or 30% longer. You, don't, you shouldn't rush out and take rapamycin because it's immunosuppressant and there's lots of, we need our immune systems to do good things. But there are more and more studies about finding is there a way to dose people with rapamycin or a derivative that will have this kind of effect of the upside without, without the downside. And a third type of intervention is called nicotinamide. I think you may have heard of NAD+. And basically, I talked about one of the theories of aging uh, is that as we age, uh, our bodies are constantly copying ourselves. It's kind of, it's what our stem cells do. But we, as we get older, we get more copying errors in that process. And one of the reason is, is that we are levels of NAD+, decrease. And so what they found is that giving an NAD plus precursor, precursor called NMN, also nicotinamide, because it's able to get into the cellular barrier in a way that NAD plus alone would not, boosts um, NAD plus levels. And that also is showing tremendous um, capabilities of extending health and lifespan in mice. As a matter of fact, David Sinclair at Harvard uh, just won an award from NASA because that repair mechanism uh, will likely be able to help, uh, sci uh, to help astronauts um, reduce some of the damage from uh, radioactivity, radiation, as they, uh, as they travel in space. So there are all of these things of mimicking the body's response to stress. There are, we talked about sequencing these older people and finding about 30 or so genes have been uh, identified that are associated with longevity. And now, I mean, one idea is you could do gene therapy or use CRISPR to try to give people those genes, but you don't have to, because what genes do is code for proteins. And so if you just understand what these genes are doing, 
then you could potentially make small molecules that could create, that could provide the proteins and the enzymes that somebody would be naturally creating if they had those genetic patterns. So there's a lot of work uh, that's being done with that. There's work being done in a, a class of drugs called senolytics. So um, our, our cells have a natural limit in the number of times that they can reproduce. And because when we reach that limit, when we're young, we have lots of stem cells, and the stem cells are themselves rejuvenating. As we get older, not only do our stem cells not work as well, but we have these zombie cells that aren't reproducing, but they're floating around. They're doing some good things. They're in some ways protecting us against tumors. Um, but when you have too many of them, then they can have a very negative, uh, a negative impact. And so there's a, this whole, as I said, a class of drugs called senolytics um, that are pruning those senescent cells. And they found with mice that's extending health span and lifespan by about, um, about 30%. There's a very long list. There's a thing I think many of you are, have heard of induced pluripotent stem cells, which is a way of inducing an adult cell into a stem cell. And what they found is first they thought, well, if these cells are going backwards in time, couldn't they then, say, get all of the cells to become younger? It's the idea behind my, my book, Eternal Sonata. And so they tried that. Scientists at Scripps tried it. And all of the, the mice, they all died because their cells went haywire. Every cell didn't really know what to do. But they tried over five years to say, well, could you have a reprogramming that wasn't going all the way, but was just going a little bit of the way backward? And they did that by genetically engineering mice and then having triggers in their water that activated certain genes. And what they found, again, they were able to kind of take these cells a little bit back in time and make these mice functionally younger. And probably the most kind of wacky thing that actually works is a process called parabiosis, which has been happening since the Middle Ages. But essentially, it's quite crude. But you cut open a mouse, a young mouse, and an old mouse, and you sew them together. And what they found is that the young mouse becomes old, and its bones, its skin, its brain after a biopsy is the brain of an old mouse. But the old mouse becomes young in all of those, in all of those same ways. And then the question, well, what's actually happening here? And so the theory was, was something in rejuvenating factors in the plasma of the young mice? So then they said, well, what if we took human cord blood and injected it into an old mouse? And the same thing happened. The old mouse with human cord blood injected became younger in many ways. So there is this rejuvenating capabilities in our blood. And now there are a number of companies, Alkahest and others, that are trying to identify, well, what are these mechanisms? And can we identify them in such a way that we can have interventions? But maybe many of you maybe have seen uh, the show Silicon Valley on, on HBO, where they have the blood boys, who are the old guy has the young, young guy who's giving, giving, giving blood. Don't try that at home. Um, so those are some of the short term. In the medium term, um, my next book, in many ways, is about the future of human reproduction. But we are moving toward a world where more and more of us will conceive of our children through IVF and pre-implantation embryo screening, PGD or, or PGS. And what that's going to do, as we understand more and more of what our genome says, and we're going to do that because we're moving to a world of personalized or precision medicine where we're all going to have our sequenced genome as the foundation of our electronic medical records. So we're going to have millions, hundreds of millions, ultimately billions of humans um, who will have their sequenced genomes and their life records together in their electronic medical records. And then we'll use AI and big data analytics and genome-wide association studies to try to understand genes. Most genes are very, it's, most of our traits are from complicated patterns of not just of genes, but genes interacting with other uh, bodily and environmental systems. But it's, it's extremely complex, but it's not magic. And so when we have a data set that's in the millions and hundreds of millions and ultimately billions, all of these things that seem incredibly complex will seem a lot less complex. Just as right now we can understand with the tools that we have a single cell organism pretty well, with the tools that we are developing, we will be able to understand even the incredible complex complexity of our own biology extremely well. And when that, when that happens, 
we're going to be able to select our embryos for all kinds of reasons, and certainly optimal health will be one, but children, future children who are going to, going to be able to live long, healthy lives, that will be something that many people will select for, because if you get a few extra years, imagine all the different things that you can do. And we've talked about, uh, and there were some sessions here, about nanobots that are already in existence of just these little molecules. Uh, Ray Kurzweil calls them mini robots, and maybe, that's, maybe they're biological robots inside of our bodies that can fix things. Uh, regenerating parts. I mean, right now, we have certain things that get regenerated, like our teeth, our baby teeth leave, and then we get adult teeth, and we only for some unknown reason, we, but our adult teeth don't come back. And it's some stem cells. It's not, but there are lots of other animals that their teeth come back. What's the difference between us and them? We're going to understand what's happening. And so we will have a greater ability to produce additional parts and replacement parts. And then in the longer term, and the, I have the word immortality uh, in the title of this talk, and I got some messages from friends in places like the, like the Buck Institute saying, well, hold on, are you sure you want to talk about immortality? Yeah, because the people who talk about immortality, whether it's Aubrey de Grey or, or Ray, uh, Ray Kurzweil, I mean, they're really talking about how can we hack our biology? And it's appealing because I talked about we get three extra months, we've gotten three extra months per year for the last hundred years. So if we keep going at this rate, we'll live really long, a long time, but we won't live forever, mathematically. But all we need to do is go from three months a year to 366 days a year. And if we do that, then we'll be able to live forever because every year you'll get one year and one day. So you kind of keep going. So we don't need to figure out the whole thing at once. You just need to get a year plus a day of additional longevity for, for every year. I think immortality in this biological form is probably impossible. I'd love to be disproven. Um, but I do think that we will, that there's a very real possibility that we're going to have, be able to have partially and, and maybe someday significantly uh, downloadable memories, downloadable brains. And then, the, we, the, which forces us to ask the question, well, if we have a downloadable brain, it'd be a downloadable snapshot of a brain at a certain moment, um, is that a person? If the, if, if the biology dies and the brain lives on in some other format, is that still the person? And it's a difficult question because certainly when people have locked in syndrome and the only thing that they can do is blink their eyes, but in the blinking of their eyes we know that their brains are working perfectly and they can write novels and do all, we, if you say is that a person, well obviously that's a person. But if you downloaded your brain at the moment of your, just before your death, and there was a fully functional robot that actually looked a lot like a human being and had a lot of your attributes, would you say, does yourself reside in that robot? I don't know the answer to that, but it's at least an interesting question. And where we are heading, there are going to be more and more of these kinds of questions about what does it mean to be a human? For so long, we've fetishized death as a mechanism for providing meaning to our lives. But do we need to? Do we need to rationalize death? Or can we think of extending our biology and our understanding of biology as in many ways we merge with our technology and create new possibilities that are very, very difficult for us to even imagine? But as we go there, and I'll end with this, we just need to remember Gilgamesh. Because Gilgamesh, he tried, he did everything that he could to try to find this secret of immortality. And he came home after having found it and lost it. He thought he had it, and then he lost it. But in the final scene, and I just reread Gilgamesh, and it's kind of, it's so amazing. Um, but he's coming back into Uruk, which is his town, and he kind of looks at it, whereas in the beginning, of the, uh, of, the, um, of the story, he's terrorizing the place. He's like breaking things and everybody is terrified of him and he comes back and he says, oh my God, look at this wonderful place with all these amazing people and this amazing civilization. And I think that's for us. I definitely am a huge believer 
that we need to do everything that we can to certainly extend our health span. Because imagine, if you, if you have just a couple more years, if you, if you extend health span of Americans just by two years, so delay by two years the age at which people get the diseases of aging, cancer, cardiovascular uh, disease, dementia, we would save over $7 trillion over 50 years. And what could we do with all of that money? But not only that, imagine all of the innovations, all of the love, all of the poetry, all of these things that we would be able to get more of. All of the children would have two extra years with their grandparents. And what's that worth? And it's worth everything. So even if immortality may be a bridge too far, I think that moving toward extend, doing what all we can to harness this incredible technology while we invest in our own humanity and our own values so that we can write more poems and create more good and build this, our version of Uruk into the glorious civilization it can be, in my mind, that seems very much worth doing. So thank you very much.